button here. Um, section 2.3 deals with something called encumbrances. And we've actually already talked quite a bit about encumbrances because it's pretty impossible to talk about the word appurtenances without talking about encumbrances. Encumbrances are appurtenances. Not all appurtenances are encumbrances, but all encumbrances are appurtenances for the most part. Here's what we mean by that. In order for something to limit the use of a property, which is what an encumbrance does, it limits the use of the property, it's probably going to have to be attached to the property, right? And isn't that the definition of an appurtenance, something that is attached to the property? So when we yes. talk about like those covenants or restrictions, and we say they're pertinent to the property, well, the type of appurtenance that they are is something called an encumbrance. But there are other encumbrances too, ones that we have not really talked about yet, like debt, owing money. We haven't really at this point brought up the idea of the property itself having debt attached to it, the property being encumbered by debt, because that can happen as well. And those debts become a pertinent to the property. But an encumbrance is really just any limitation at all that is placed on the, the use of the property moving forward. One of the most common examples of an encumbrance, and, and we see these really on just about every property that we deal with in some way or another is something called easement. You will see this on the test. There is no doubt about it that you will see easements on the test. You will have to answer easement questions on the test. You're going to have to deal with easements in the real world. These are going to be super important to people in the real world. Here's what the, let's talk about the definition of an easement, and then we're going to kind of really get into how they practically work and what you need to understand about them. Imagine if a piece of property, a piece of land has on it, not the entire piece of land, but just a small section of that piece of land has on it an area which has essentially been marked as forever providing free access to somebody who does not own the property. I'm, I'm going to kind of go through that again. I want you to think about, think about your yard. Think about your, your front yard. What if when you bought your house, somebody said to you, this 10 foot wide strip of your front yard, you have to allow this person, this company, or even the public maybe, access to that 10 foot strip of land forever. You can't tell people to get off. They're not going to be trespassing because they have the right to be there. Even though you own this property, we have given them an easement on that property. So an easement is basically permanent permission to have access to a piece of property without having ownership of the piece of property. Well, here's why that becomes so important, folks. Who do you think is going to have to honor that permission? Who's going to have to allow this person to come on this property from now until whenever? The owner. All the, the property, property owners. owners. The owner of the property. And so when the owner of that property, when somebody buys that property, they have to understand that there is this right of somebody to access it. Now, some, Crystal put in the chat, like a private island that has a section that allows people to visit or vacation whenever they want. That might be true. Th that might be true, Crystal, but here's the thing. We wouldn't spend time talking about it if it only applied to private islands in the Seychelles somewhere. These easements are on almost every property. Almost every piece of real estate has easements on them. The one you're sitting in right now. 
let, let, let me give you an example of an easement on a piece of property. How many of you have electricity at your house? Okay. How does, how does they are the, all rich. How does the electricity get onto your property? Through the electric. Through the cables. Through, through cables, wires. through wires. And those wires may be overhead or they may be buried okay. underground. But who do those wires can, belong to? Can we all agree that those wires do not belong to us? They belong to the power company. Can we agree with that? Yes. Yes. Except those wires are not on the power company's property. Whose property do those wires cross? And not just the ones that are actually leading to our house, but the ones that are carrying power to our neighbor's house. Who, whose property do those lines go across? Yours, ours. Our, our, our. My property. And folks, remember, if I own the land, no matter where those, no matter where those lines are, if they're buried in the ground, do I own what's below the ground? Yes. Yeah. yes. If they're overhead, do I own the airspace overhead? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yes. So how in the world can Duke Power have the right to have that power line stretch across my property? And by the way, let me point out, not just the right for the power line to stretch across my property. What's going to happen if a storm knocks that power line down what's going to happen if that if a storm comes and knocks that power line down where it crosses my property what is going to be the next thing that's going to happen they got to come onto your property property somebody from duke power is coming onto my property to do what with that power line fix it fix it and here's my question. These are big old trucks and shit. Are they going to stand out at the street with a bullhorn and ask permission to come on my property? No. no. They have the ability to do it. No. Are they going to care that they're driving a 12-ton truck across my front yard where my sprinkler system is? No. No, I don't care. No. And you know Sorry, why, Rosebusters. You know why they don't have to ask my permission you know why they don't have to care that they're driving across my sprinkler system or through my rose bushes because so they, they have, have been granted an easement that allows them legally to be there as a matter of fact and here's what you need to understand about an easement before we go any further if i told duke power get off my property i own this property who would legally be in the wrong? Me, the owner of the property, or Duke Power, who is operating within their easement? The owner. We, the owner. The owner of the property. Now, do I also have the right to be in that easement, to use the easement? I want to be clear about that, too, because I want to make sure people understand it. Do I also have the right? Yes. 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 yes, of course I do, because it's my property. It's clear that I have the right to be there. What's not as clear is why is this company who has no ownership whatsoever of that part of my land have the legal right to be there, to drive their trucks over it, to come in, to work on those power lines anytime they want to. And the reason they have that legal right is because at some point in the past, they were granted an easement. Does that help everybody understand what an easement is? Mm-hmm. Very, very cool. And Travis, I do have a quick question before we move forward to kind of relate something from the previous chapter. So if an encumbrance is any restriction or limit on real property, would that also fall under the different types of limits of ownership? Sure. Absolutely. Okay. Like life estates. Absolutely. Stuff like that. A okay. life estate would be an encumbrance on that property because it limits how long that owner is going to own that property. A, Got it. A fee simple determinable deed would be an encumbrance on the property because it limits what the property can be used for, right? Those right. are all examples. Any limitation at all is an encumbrance. Heard. Thank you. Okay. Even laws. Laws are encumbrances if they limit what you can do with the property. If there's a law that says you can't dump nuclear waste in the backyard, that's an encumbrance because in theory, as the property owner, you should be able to do whatever you want to do there, 
right? If you have completely unencumbered use of the property, un, unlimited use. But it, so anything that limits what the owner can do with the property is going to be considered an encumbrance. Okay. Is there any kind of instance where an encumbrance would be um, a physical structure? Um, I can't really think of an encumbrance as being a physical structure because physical okay. structures don't usually limit the use of the property. They usually sure. add to the use of the property. Okay. So, uh, I can't think of an encumbrance as being a physical structure, not necessarily. Okay. Thank you. Just trying and, to... So remember, appurtenances come in like two categories, good and bad, right? Some appurtenances are good and some are bad. Here's the way to think of en encumbrances. They're the bad appurtenances, right? Encumbrances are the bad things that are attached to property that limit the use of the property. From whose perspective we're looking at it? From the owner's <laughs> perspective. From the owner, from the property owner's perspective. So now, thank you. <laughs> on the test, you are going to be expected to identify. So right here, I can tell you where the test question is going to come from, and we got to spend thirty minutes talking about it to get it in your brain. But literally, the test question is coming from this slide right here. They're gonna want you to identify the difference between an appurtenant easement and an easement in gross. They're gonna want you to be able to recognize the difference on the test between an appurtenant easement and an easement in gross. Well, before we even talk about these, look at this word right here and tell me what right away and if you're not making this association, you need to start to make this association. When you see the word appurtenant, what meaning should that imme immediately trigger in your mind about anything when we label it with appurtenant? What are some things yeah. that should go to your mind? Forever. 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 So Forever. an appurtenant easement is an easement that's going to last how long, folks? Forever. 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 Here's the thing. If one type of easement is a pertinent, that one is going to last forever. If there are two categories of them, do you think they're both going to last forever? Or do you think the big difference between these is going to be, or at least one of the big differences is going to be that the easement in gross is not forever. What do y'all think? It's not forever. Not forever. Not forever. That's exactly right. The easement in gross is not forever. I can't write today. Not forever. The pertinent easement is going to be forever. The easement in gross is going to be not forever. There are two other things or two other ways really to really identify whether we're dealing with an appurtenant easement or an easement in gross. First of all, if you can tell, if you can tell that the easement is going to go away at some point in time, it's automatically what? Well, and gross. Gross. And gross. If the if the easement is literally never going to end, we know it's what kind of an easement? A pertinent, a pertinent easement. Okay? A pertinent. The other way that you can identify a pertinent easements from easements in gross is easements in gross deal with one property at a time. It relates between a property and a person or a company. So when I say that Duke Power has an easement over my yard, how many pieces of real estate did I talk about in that, in that statement? One. 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 And so I talked about one piece of real estate and one company. Which one of these descriptions does it look like I just fulfilled right there? Is that, is that an easement in gross or is that an appurtenant easement? Easement in gross. gross. That's an easement in gross. Eliza has the right to fish in a pond on a property that she does not own until she dies. Does that sound that like an appurtenant easement or does that sound like an easement in gross? Easement, easement in gross. gross. Easement in gross. Because I only talked about how many pieces of property? Eliza Fine. has the right to fish on a property she does not own. How many pieces of property did I talk about? One. One. Yeah. One. And the property has to give this right to a person or a company. That's an easement in gross. You got to learn to recognize that. 
filter that out. It really is that simple. Mandy owns a property that gives her an easement over her neighbor's property for a shared driveway. Which one does that sound like, folks? Appurtenant. That's an appurtenant easement. How do you know it's appurtenant? How many properties did I talk about? Two. 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 I said that Mandy owns one property and, and she has the right to use a portion of the neighboring property for a shared driveway. Two properties that are side by side. What kind of easement do we have there? Pertinent. Pertinent easement. So when you re read these examples, be very careful to look and see, are we talking about one property or are we talking about two properties? Yeah. That's going to be a big giveaway as to what type of easement we're talking about. The What's other... It? Go ahead. The other thing to look for is whether or not there's an end. See, here's the thing. When I said Eliza has the right to fish in a pond on a property she does not own, is that right going to end at some point? Yes. Yeah, when she dies. When, she, when Eliza is no more, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't say that... Eliza plus a bunch of other people have the right to use the pond. I said, Eliza has the right to use the pond. But now look at this one. Mandy owns a property that has the right to use a portion of the neighboring property for a shared driveway. Does that easement ever end right there? No. Yeah. No, 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 because even if Mandy no longer owns the property, isn't somebody else going to own the property? Yes. Yes. Right? yes. And that somebody else is going to have the same easement that Mandy had. And that somebody else behind them is going to have the easement that Mandy had. That easement belongs to the property, and that's an appurtenant easement. So let's talk about the appurtenant easement in more detail. Whenever we're talking about an appurtenant easement, we have... <laughs> adjacent adjacent just means side by side they share a boundary they must be side by side they must share a boundary this is not negotiable for an appurtenant easement okay and basically with every easement there's a winner and a loser the loser is the person who is the property that has the easement on it the winner is whoever benefits from the easement. Does that make sense for everybody? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So when earlier when I talked about the easement for Duke Power on my property, who wins in that easement? Who's the winner? Duke Power. The company. The, the Duke company. Power is because they get the right to access my property without having to own my property. Who's the loser in that easement? The owner. The, owner. the property owner, right? The owner. Whoever owns the property. In an appurtenant you easement. You see how quick I was to say you? That's right, me. Exactly. <laughs> I'm the loser. Exactly. Okay. Um, in an appurtenant easement, because there are two pieces of property, there still is a winner and a loser. It's just that one of these properties is the winner and the other property is the what? Loser. Is the loser. 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 Now, here's how we're going to... Now, we don't label them winners or losers in a court of law. In a court of law, we like to use fancy terminology. Here's the fancy terminology for winners and losers in easement, a pertinent easements in a court of law. Servient and, in and dominant. Which one do y'all think is the winner here? The dominant okay. property or the servient, servient property? The dominant. Dominant. the dominant property is the winner. You don't want to be the servant, right? Mm -hmm. Right? You, nobody wants to be the servant. You want to dominate. So the dominant property is the winner. What that means is that the dominant property is the one that's taking advantage of the servient property. Does that make sense for everybody? Yep. Okay. So you've got, whenever you have an appurtenant easement, you got two properties side by side, and one of the two is a bully. One of the two 
takes advantage of the other because one of the two not only uses all of its land, but it uses for free some of the neighboring property's land. Is everybody, is that idea starting to get in everybody's brain about what an appurtenant easement is? Mm -hmm. Yes, and I do see here, and I love what Alicia said, servient is serving somebody else. That's exactly right. And in this case, servient is serving the neighboring property. The, the property right beside us, this piece of land is serving that piece of land. Does it have to be free? No. Does it have to be free? What do you mean, free of charge? Yeah, to be in because didn't you just say it's that she could do it for free? Is it can you you charge for the easement? You can charge initially when you set them up. You can certainly charge someone for the easement initially, but on an ongoing basis, it's there, there's no payment mm -hmm. on an ongoing basis. Oh, shoot. Okay. I like the way Elizabeth thinks, though. I'd be setting it up like 540. Well, the, <laughs> charge every time. The thing, if you think about it, because is this not going to be a huge detriment to the servient property that you have to give access for how long? Forever. Forever, Forever to some portion of your property that the neighboring property owner gets to take advantage of. So this is a huge benefit for the dominant property and a huge negative for the servient property. Does that make sense for everybody? Mm -hmm. okay. And I do see a little statement there. It says easements run with the land and this would only fall under a pertinent, correct? And we'll touch base on that, that statement correct. again. A pertinent easements run with the land because they are a pertinent, right? Okay, and, I'll and bring it back up. All easements have to be recorded to be enforceable. Think about this. It would be, how do people know what's attached to a property they're buying? They have to be able to find it where? Where, 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 where do you always go? Courthouse. Public. Courthouse. Record at the county courthouse, right? So if anything like this that's going to be permanent and impact the property forever needs to be recorded at the county courthouse. And literally what we're going to find at the county courthouse is going to be a map. It's going to be a picture and it's going to show the easement clearly drawn on the lot. So here's an overhead view of an appurtenant easement between two side-by-side -side properties. Now the blue line that I've put there is the property line. So you've got lot number two up there at the top and lot number one down here at the bottom. Does everybody see what we're looking at now, right? So we're looking at two pieces of property. The blue line is the property line and we've got lot number two at the top and lot number one at the bottom. Now, if there were no easement here, let's, let's, let, let's leave the subject of an easement out for just a second. What is, if you were just looking at this from above, which lot has a big problem with this situation right here? Which lot has a major problem? Lot two. Lot one. Lot one. I'd say lot one's got the problem. Yeah, because lot two has to, yeah. Lot, lot, don't forget the shared part. Mm -hmm. Forget the shared part. Lot one has a problem. They don't have a what, folks? Driveway. 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 They don't have a driveway. For them to stay on their property, they got no access, no egress to the property. That's a problem, right? Yes. Sir. See, the reason people misunderstand easements is they look at them backwards. You look at this and you say lot two's got a problem. I say, hell no, lot one's got a problem. Yeah. Lot one literally needs a helicopter to get to their house <laughs> without trespassing. But the easement is the solution to that problem. At some point in time, somebody came in and said, this is not going to work. We need to create an easement right here that allows anybody who is on lot number one to come on to this portion of lot number two and use it for access and egress. Does that make sense for everybody? No. Mm -hmm. So taking that in consideration, now lot two has a problem. Now, once we've created the solution, lot two has the problem. That's exactly right. The problem existed for lot one. The solution 
becomes a problem for lot two. Now, here's what I want to point out, because Tyler asked a great question. Tyler said, so who grants these easements? Folks, like every other thing in the world, who's the only person at any given time who can place restrictions on a piece of private property? The grantor. The grantor, the owner. But, but who is the grantor, though? Mama. That's a fancy the word. The owner of the uh, property. The, the owner property. of the property in question. Which <laughs> lot is this easement being created on? Number two. Number two. Lot number two. So which owner had to create the easement? Number two. The owner of lot number two. Does the easement benefit lot number two? No, no benefit number one. No. no, it benefits number one. So here's where we have the problem with the creation of the easement. We have to incentivize lot number two to agree to this. Does that make sense for everybody? That if, you're, if your neighbor comes to you and says, hey, I need to have an easement so I can use your driveway, that's where Elizabeth's question comes into play. Elizabeth asked, can we charge for this? And I said, well, not on an ongoing basis, but do you think there could have been money exchanged in the beginning between the owners of lot number one and lot number two in exchange for lot number two creating this easement on their property? What do y'all think? Yes. I, I wouldn't do it for free. Would y'all? Mm -hmm. No. Not at all. Here's the only way I can think of that that easement got created for free. Family. Well, that's not the only, I mean, that, that might be, but if there's a more simple explanation. See, this is where your brains are too locked in. You haven't learned mm -hmm. to think big picture yet. At some point, weren't lot number one and lot number two the same lot? At mm -hmm. some point, wasn't this an undivided piece of land? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. At some point, didn't one person own all of this land and subdivide it into these two lots? Mm. Yes. Mm -hmm. When do you think the easement most likely got created, folks? When they sell the property and divide it by two. When they subdivided it. When they subdivided it. Because at the point in time when they subdivided it, wasn't the owner of lot number one and the owner of lot number two the same person? Yes. Yeah. Probably. And if you uh, yes. own both lots, isn't it pretty dang easy to create this easement? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Because here's what happened. Somebody divided these things and decided they wanted to sell lot number one. And they realized, well, I can't sell it without an easement. So let me go ahead and create an easement on lot number two, which I also own. And that makes lot number one sellable. So who mostly creates these appurtenant easements? Think about with the most common source of these appurtenant easements, isn't it developers? Yes. Right? Yes. When they're yes. subdividing these properties. Is that starting to click in, right? Of how these mostly get created? Now, it doesn't have to be that way, but that is by far the most common way, right? Now, Mandy asked a great question. She said, if repairs need to be made on the driveway, is the owner of lot number two responsible? Well, now... First of all, before I answer your question, Mandy, here's what I want to point out. Two parties can agree in a, a written agreement to anything they want to. So there could be a written agreement where they've agreed over time to share the maintenance of this thing. But if there was not such a written agreement created, which is what ends up happening most of the time, who's going to be responsible for all the cost of maintenance of this driveway? Whose property is it on? Lot number two. Lot number two. It's their driveway to maintain. Lot number one gets the milk without having to buy the cow. Lot number one gets to use but not maintain. So if we were labeling these two properties and we know one of them has to be dominant and servient, Let's talk about lot number one. How would we label lot number one? Is lot number one the dominant property or is lot number one the servient property? What do y'all think? Dominant. Dominant. 
Lot number one is the dominant property. If you say in servient, you're looking at it entirely bass backwards, as my granddad would say. <laughs> Lot number one has all the best of every world right here. Who has to push the snow off the driveway? Lot two. Lot two. Who has to pay to repave the driveway? Lot two. Lot two. Lot two. Lot two. Who gets to use the driveway? Number one. Number Both one. one and two. But one only gets the benefits and none of the cost. That sounds very dominant to me, doesn't it, to you all? Yes. So lot number two is what? Servient. Servient. The servient. Lot number two is the servient property. This is going to be a trend you're going to see repeated with every easement, which this is a test question right here. I, I, I don't know what's on the test, but I can pretty much guarantee you something like this is coming. Which property is the easement located on? Is it located on the dominant property or the servient property? Servient. <laughs> the servient property, because the easement is like permission to be used, right? Mm -hmm. And the easement is the, you know, like take advantage of me type thing. And it's the servient property that's going to be taken advantage of. Is that okay for everybody so far? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Good. Hey, Travis, I have a quick question okay, about cool. this map. Anything below the blue line, lot one is still responsible for. So even if the driveway connects to lot two, anything below that blue line for the driveway Lot one is responsible for right, yeah, right. right. Yep, anything below. That's so right. if it needs to so be any, anything in this section right here, right. lot number one is responsible for. Gotcha. Okay. But anything on the other side over there, anything in this area? Oops, sorry. Let me do that. Back up. Anything in this area? I thought I changed colors. Anything in this area over here? is lot two's responsibility. And how long is that going to last? Forever. 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 So Forever. If, if we sell lot number two, is the next owner of lot number two going to have to agree to live with this situation? Yes. 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 And is the, the owner after that going to have to live with this situation? Yes. yes. Right. Now, here's what you need to understand. Is it, let's say Bob owns the dominant property. I got to change colors so that you can't see that. Let's say Bob owns the dominant property here. Is it Bob that has the right to use that driveway or is it Bob's property that has the right to use that driveway? Bob's, Bob's property. property. Bob has it's to Bob's property. And here's how we know that's true. Because if Bob sells the property, Bob doesn't keep the right to use the driveway, right? Right. Right. If Bob sells the property to Tom, then Tom has the right to use the driveway because now it's Tom's property that has the right to use the driveway. Does that make sense for everybody? Yep. Mm -hmm. And that's why this is called an appurtenant easement because the rights belong to the property, not the people. Okay. Yeah, wrong, wrong with the land. So, um, uh, Russell said, can lot one add like a basketball goal or add more driveway in his lot, even though it's lot two's driveway? Yes, lot, uh, lot one can do whatever they want to on their own property, right? They can't, they can't make changes on somebody else's property. All the easement grants them is access to the property but they can certainly make changes on their own property. You own your own property. So if lot number one wants to come over here and do things, you know, here on their property, that's on their property. They can do whatever they want to. Okay. And yes, Peyton, they could certainly come to an agreement. They could certainly come to an agreement to share maintenance here. And ideally that would be a good thing to do. How many of y'all feel like if this was created, the smart thing would have been, to have like a written maintenance agreement where they share the cost of maintenance over the years, right? Yeah. yeah. But that doesn't always happen. Can you imagine selling lot number one 50 years after this was created 
if there was no shared maintenance agreement. Because here's going to be the practical problem. Lot number one is going to say, well, this driveway is crappy. It's got a bunch of potholes in it. And you would have to say to that person, well, you got to sue your neighbor. It's your neighbor's responsibility. You got to sue them and make them fill the driveway in. That's not going to make for good friends across the fence, is it? Mm -mm. So these create quite a few problems for us in the real estate industry, these shared. Even, and by the way, how many of you all have ever seen somebody have like family land where they just cut like a path up into a field and they put like six houses, six houses. on either side of the paths? Mm -hmm. The only way you can accomplish that, folks, is with these kind of easements. You have to give these easements to, to go across the property, to get access. Those private roadways and stuff like that are accomplished with these sort of easements. Can I ask a question, Travis? Sure. In, um, when I owned my farm, it was on a gravel road, right? There were several properties on either side. And the gravel road went directly to the two properties in the back to give them access. There was no road maintenance agreement. And I don't think there was an easement recorded. Of course, my realtor didn't point it out to me if there was. So I'm wondering, we had a dispute, a neighbor and I about it. She wanted me to, um, what, to dig the trench on my side, uh, on my part of the, of the road so that the water could flow down. Well, you know, I wasn't gonna do that. So, um, it caused a lot of hassle. And so I suggested a road maintenance agreement and, they, and everybody said, no, we don't want to do that. So right. I understand. Well, that's, and that's why the better time to create them is when you're first creating the easement. You know, I like agree. That's, yeah. that, that's the time to do it is when you first create the easement for sure. Now, uh, let's can talk you go about back the, to that um, <clears throat> again, please just back up one second. Sure. Thank you. So if I wanted to buy lot number one from Tom, I think you, I just want to repeat what you said. I can do my research by going to the county courthouse on this piece of property. And there should be, you said a picture or a map that I can find in the courthouse that will that describe exactly, the easement. That is exactly right. Okay. There will be. When we say the easement has to be recorded, the way you record an easement is with a map. You okay. literally record a map of the property and you show the location of the easement on the property so that every subsequent um, uh, person who's interested in purchasing that property can see the map, see where the easement's located and understand what they're gonna be dealing with after they purchase the property. Now, now you talked about a maintenance agreement with the other student. Would that be on the map too? Or would that usually, be in the courthouse? If there, usually if there is one, it would either be on the map itself or it would make reference to it. The map would say, you know, please see maintenance agreement, which is separately recorded at, and it would give you the book and page number for the maintenance agreement. And that would be recorded as well. Ah, oh, okay. Thank you. Yep. So, and that's, and that's the real, and that's a great question, Howard, because what it gets to is the whole purpose of why we record this stuff at the county courthouse, because otherwise you'd never be able to find it. Does that make sense for everybody? You'd never be able to know what people were getting into when they were buying property if we didn't have one place to, you know, centralize all these records about these properties. I mean, heck, it's complicated enough even with one place because you got to know what you're looking for. But imagine if we didn't have that one central place, it'd be impossible. Yeah. Now, the other type of easement, so those were the pertinent easements. Remember, sort of buzzwords or things to remember. A pertinent easements always involve how many pieces of property? Two. 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 They are side Two. by side, right? The easement itself is located on a property that we call the servient property, the one that's being taken advantage of. Oh, and the neighboring property is called the dominant property, the one that takes advantage. That, that's an appurtenant easement and it lasts forever, okay? Um, now, the easement in gross is an easement that exists only on one property at a time. Now, it very well may be true that the, the, there may be many easements in gross that connect to each other to accomplish an overall goal. But as far as the easement, it's on one property at a time. So an easement in gross is an easement where the property owner has given access to a person or a company. 
not to a neighboring property, but specifically to a person or a company. I give access to Summer. So who has access to my property? Summer. 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 And only Summer. Here's the interesting thing, folks. Can Summer transfer that? Can she transfer it to somebody else? Can she give that right to somebody else? What do y'all think? No. 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 Because I didn't give somebody else the right to access my property. I only gave who that, the right to access my property. Summer. 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 If, if I give Duke Power or I give Google Fiber the right to access my property, they cannot transfer that, folks, because they were the only ones given that right of access. Does that make sense for everybody? Yes. Okay. So this is not going to be an easement where the benefit is gonna change. It will be an easement though, that will still have to be honored by future owners. Because if I give Summer the right to access my property, Summer is gonna keep the right to access the property even if it's no longer mine. If I sell the property to Rachel, does Summer still have the, access to, the right to access the property? What do y'all think? Yes. yes. The property is the one that gave permission. That's right. That's exactly right. Because the property gave permission to Summer. And that right is going to stay until what happens? When will this easement and gross go away? Because it will go away. That's the key here to them. They will end. When will that easement and gross? If we say Summer has the right to walk across our property to access the Greenway. When Summer dies. When Summer dies. Summer dies. When Summer dies when she's no longer a person, then that Is easement that cool? will vanish because the easement was only there to benefit Summer and Summer is no more. Does that make so sense for everybody? The easement owner is Summer, not the owner of the property. That is correct. The easement owner is not the owner of the property. The easement owner is the, is the beneficiary of this easement setup, right? I have a question. I, when I bought my house, I have got a lot of fruit trees here that the previous owners planted. And I told the owner who was 85 that she, as long as I own the house, she can come pick the pomegranates off the tree and everything like that. I don't have that in writing, but I gave her permission to do that. Would that be the same thing? It would not be the same thing because I'm going to go back to a comment I made on the last one. Easements always have to be what? Recorded, okay. Recorded in order to be enforceable. What you've given them is something called a license. A license is just permission, okay. which can be taken away at any time. And, and so that's a really great, really great way you ask it, Mandy. And basically, what you gave was an easement, but it's not an enforceable easement. Okay. How could you have made it enforceable? Put that on a map, <coughs> put that map and do what with it? Record it recorded at the county courthouse. So the difference between permission to be there and an easement is, are we taking it to the courthouse, okay, right? Okay. If we take it to the courthouse and record it, it's no longer just permission. It's no longer just a license. It's now an easement. Yeah. And, it, and, and so it has a much more permanent status. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Okay. So I'm sure you're getting to this, Travis. What if um, a company was to change into a different company? So that's the one time where you might see some change in an easement in gross. Companies cannot just transfer their easements. But if they are absorbed by other companies, then the easements that they have will be absorbed by the new bigger company. In other words, let me point this out. Duke Power has not always had an easement over my property. That easement, if you actually go look it up on the map of my property, says Carolina Power and Light. How many of y'all remember CPNL, right? Something that you got to be around. You got to be around North Carolina a long time to remember CPNL because CPNL eventually was bought by Progress Energy. So that that easement that on the map still shows it belongs to CPNL. When Progress Energy bought CPNL, Progress Energy took over the benefit of that easement. Does that make sense for everybody? And then, of course, Progress Energy was eventually bought by who? Duke Power. By Duke, Duke Power. Power. 
So even though now you look at the map, the map still says the easement belongs to Carolina Power and Light because Carolina Power and Light is essentially a subsidiary of Duke Power. Duke Power has the easement. Okay, and just to clarify on that, so Duke Power can't, okay, so the, the, the easement can't be assigned, but right. they Duke absorbed? Power, Duke Power cannot just sell the easement itself to Google. They can't just okay. go and say all of a sudden, oh, we had this easement, we're going to sell it to you. But Google could buy the whole company and absorb their easements. So Duke Power can't just sell the easements, but what they can do is be completely absorbed by another company and that company would absorb the easements with them. Okay, so just to write that out, commercial easements cannot be assigned or inherited, but if a company is absorbed, they also absorb that easement. That's exactly right. That's Got exactly it. exactly right. You absorb the assets of a company you absorb is what, you, is what it boils down to, okay? Now, here's where people get themselves all screwy with easements and gross. I, I wanna focus you on something. Does an easement and gross end? Yes. 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 Duke Power has an easement over my front yard. Is that an easement in gross or is that an appurtenant easement? Uh, easement, easement in gross. In gross. That's an easement. I heard in somebody gross. say appurtenant. Yeah, I know. I heard it too. That's an easement in gross. How many properties did I talk about? One. One property and one company. That's an easement in gross. Do not get talked out of it being an easement and gross because people are like that's never ending they're duke power that's <laughs> bullshit people even duke power will eventually do what so disappear they will disappear they will not exist they didn't exist a hundred years ago they won't exist a hundred years from now and when they don't exist anymore what will happen to their easements and they and. will go away so here's a perfect example there is, if you look at the map of my property, there is an easement and gross that does not exist anymore on my property. Across the back of my property, there is an easement and gross for a telecommunications company called MCI. How many of you all remember MCI? I okay. do. Right. MCI has not been sold or absorbed by other companies. MCI literally declared bankruptcy and went out of business. And when MCI declared bankruptcy and went out of business, what happened to all of their easements? And they, died. They, died, they died with the company, right? So easements and gross will go away whenever the easement holder goes away. Is everybody okay with that? Mm-hmm. So, Ew, dad. So, so the company that replaced MCI, okay, MCI went out of business. There is no company that replaced it. Oh, oh, okay. I thought, okay. In the case of MCI, they just ceased to exist. Gotcha. They closed the doors, which is not like CPNL. CPNL doesn't exist anymore, but they didn't cease to exist. They were absorbed by other companies. And that's why the CPNL easement still exists, while the MCI easement does not. Okay. Does that help for everybody? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. So when you look at something like this drawing, you see easements and gross, you know, are used in quite a lot of ways. You see, you've got here an easement and gross right here for utilities. You've got another utility easement and gross across the back of the property. Is every property, especially in an urban area, going to have a lot of these easements and gross for utilities? I mean, yeah. think about think about my yeah. house in Cary. The town of Cary has an easement for water and sewer pipes to run across the front of the yard. Google Fiber has an easement. AT and T has an easement across there. Um, Spectrum, which used to be Charter, which used to be uh, Time Warner Cable, uh, Warner. Um, and Time Warner, yeah, all of that is has an easement across there. Um, um, you've got easements for public what used to be public service in North Carolina but is now Dominion Energy for natural gas um, there's easements of course for Duke Power there, there's all sorts of easements to get those utilities across my property because if you can't get it across my property not only can you not service my property you also can't service my neighbors who are further down the street does that make sense for everybody 
Yes. And so who likely created all those easements way back when? Who was the most likely source of all those easements originally? Developer. Developer. The developer. The developer. The developer gave all those easements away because they needed Duke Power to come in here and run electricity to all these properties. They needed public service in North Carolina to run natural gas to all these properties. They needed water and sewer. So they just gave away those easements back in the day. Now, here's what I want you to understand about the practical application of an easement. The owner of the property cannot block the easement holder from their legal access. So I, I'm gonna, let's, let's use this picture we've got right here for a second. Let's say this owner decides to fence in their backyard. First of all, it's their property. Can they fence in their backyard? Yes. Sure. They sure can. You can't stop somebody from fencing in their backyard. So they've got the fence around their backyard. Because they have the right of control. Right. But now, is... Duke Power owed access to this easement that runs across the backyard back here. Are they owed access? Yes. 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 If you put a fence <laughs> there that does not have gates in it on either side where that easement is located, have you hindered Duke Power's legal access to yes. the property, even though it's your property? Yes. 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 And folks, don't be surprised if you come home and see that they've driven over that fence with their big ass truck to work on that <laughs> power line. And they have every legal right to do so because <laughs> you were the, not only can they drive over your fence, they can bill you for the scratches the fence puts on the side of their truck because you were the one in the wrong by uh. impeding their access. Even though it's your property, that easement is allows them to have 24 hour a day, seven day a week access whenever they need it. So, so and, not only does the property owner pay for their own property damage, they pay for the company's personal property that's damage. Exactly right. And so listen, look, but you know, all joking aside, this is where I get into the practical application of these things. Like I tell people who are, I'm selling property when they have an easement like that across their backyard, yes, you can put a fence up. Make sure you, number one, you put gates in there. Number two, make sure if you're going to have like animals, make oh, sure you don't put tell signs it. on the gates so that Duke Power knows to contact you before they open that gate. Because what if your dog's out in the backyard and Duke Power opens the gate because they need access, which they have the legal right to do, and your dog gets out and gets run over in the street? It's not their fault. So th there are all kinds of implications here. Now, obviously, the easier solution would be to put the fence inside the easement, right? You know, if somebody wants to put the fence, but people don't like to do that because then they feel like they've cheated themselves out of part of their property, you know, but so you got to make the decision about how you want to handle that, but don't impede their access. That, that's the big take. Heard. So yeah, because, go ahead. So if we're, you know, talking about like Google, Google Fiber or Spectrum or whatever, they have an easement to run their lines, you know, uh, let's say a, a, across the front of your property to connect the entire neighborhood, to run through the neighborhood. Yep. But, but when you sign up for service and they have to come out, and this would happen more so in new construction or someone who's never had service before, when they have to come out and connect a line to your home, that's not an easement, right? That's usually not an easement because you actually signed an order for that. And so usually they'll say that you actually own the line to the street, you know, from the house to the street type thing. And the, the, the line that they own is the main service line. Gotcha, gotcha. That's usually how they do that. Okay. And yes, Sierra, usually these companies do not want to be bullies. They usually would knock on your door. They'll usually contact you. But the key here is not what they would usually do, but what they're legally obligated and what they're legally entitled to do. Remember, as real estate brokers, we have to warn people about the worst case scenario of things. So when these easements are there, we have to warn people and say, you know, you could come home and somebody and they could have dug up your flower bed here. Because if they need to access that water line, that's what they're going to do. You know, I, I, I would tell you, I got so frustrated. So I resodded my yard this, this past spring, resodded mm -hmm. the whole front yard. Now I've got a bunch of easements across the front yard and nobody's dug in my front yard in 10 years. 
and I will be damned if AT&T didn't come through and trench up three feet wide in my front yard a week after I put down new sod. I wanted to kill them. I literally wanted to go out there and strangle them with that machine that they were burying that cable with. But they have the right to do it because they have the easement. <laughs> the guy felt so bad. He looked at me when I pulled in the driveway. He said, man, I hate to do it. He said, I'm sitting here looking at this new grass and I'm just like, this guy's going to kill me when he gets home. But <laughs> it did. <laughs> and they have the right. And they have the right. That's funny. Okay. Um, so most of them, so Kayla, are actually voluntary. Most <laughs> of the time, the developer gives these easements voluntarily. And remember, if, the, if they were given voluntarily by a previous owner, they're voluntary by all the subsequent owners because the subsequent owners have a choice, buy it or don't buy it. So most easements are created voluntarily. They can, however, be created involuntarily. There is a method by which the courts can create easements. Um, and that, that can happen. You don't need to know a lot about that process. It's just to know that if, the, if somebody really, really wants an easement over your property, they always have the ability to go to a court of law and ask a court of law to grant the easement. Now, that it's a pretty big bar for proving to a court of law that you need the easement. And it usually relates to things like utilities. So as an example, I have a new one across my property within the last two years for Google Fiber. Um, the, town of, the town of Cary wanted Google Fiber to come in and install uh, fiber optic cable throughout the city so that there was gigabit internet at every property in the town. And Google said, well, we'll do that, but we need an easement across every property in Cary. And so the town created those easements. The town went to court, made the argument in North Carolina District Court that it was in the best interest of the public, that every property in Cary have an easement for Google Fiber. And they walked out of court that day with a judgment that said Google Fiber has got an easement on every single piece of property in Cary. Wow. And so, um, yes, courts can create these easements. Okay. How are we feeling so far about easement? Pretty good? Pretty good. That's I have good. A, um, I have a scenario for the prescriptive easement. Mm -hmm. um, there was an area when I was living in California where the kids used to cut across this front lawn every single day to go to school and had been doing it forever and ever and ever. So in order to not create a prescriptive easement, the owner gave permission for people to cross his land. Yep. And uh, then they couldn't do it, right? right. That's correct. Permission prevents, so prescriptive easements are a pretty simple idea of the law. Basically, if you allow people to access your property for such a long time that it basically becomes the expectation, they can go, those people can go to court and make an argument that they should have the legal right to continue, um, that it would be unfair to make them stop at this point in time. And that's called an easement by prescription if the court creates it. So yeah, the best way to prevent an easement by prescription is actually give them permission to access the property because they can't say that they can't take what you're giving them freely anyway. So yeah. Hey Travis, I know this might be a stupid question, but this is the first time I've seen it in these new slides. Um, what's the importance of express grant and express reservation? Did I just miss that? Yeah, there's not any significance. It's just there in case you happen to see the vocabulary on the test. It, 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 all they deal with was, is with which property is which. If you are um, creating the easement when you develop the property and you're selling one of the lots, if, if you as the developer hold on to the one with the servient, if you hold on to the servant property, you created the easement through an express grant. If you hold on to the dominant property, you created it with an express reservation. I do not think you will be tested on those. It's just you may see the terminology pop up in something, but it's not going to be significant to the to the answer, though. Is it um, is it uh, too much to give like a small example? Uh, I mean, in a new construction community, I'm just trying to see how this. So if you, in a new construction, if you go back to our picture of an appurtenant easement, I'm the developer and I am cre I'm subdividing these lots and I'm going to sell lot number one, but keep lot number two. Then I've created the easement through an express grant. 
Okay. Because I'm keeping the servient property. Got it. If I was creating, if I was doing the subdivision, but keeping lot number one and selling lot number two, I would be making an express reservation because I'm reserving the right to use lot number two in the future. Okay. Thank you. Express is voluntary. Yeah. Express means voluntary. It means stated and voluntary, but grant or reservation just refers to which one of the two properties you're going to keep as the developer. Okay. And just so everybody knows, I'm just going to put in the chat voluntary and involuntary in your recap notes. I'll include all that. Yeah. Okay. Um, how do we get rid of easements? I mean, I'm telling you, the, the easement questions you're going to get are going to be pretty straightforward as far as um, can you tell the difference between an appurtenant easement and an easement in gross? Don't lose sight of the forest for the trees when it comes to easements. Um, another test question you might see is about how easements go away. We know that easements and gross go away when what happens? A person or company, company dies. Person when the dies person or company who benefits from the easement dies. We know that. We know that appurtenant easements usually don't go away. The only way an appurtenant easement is going to go away is a court of law. A court of law would have to be asked to terminate <laughs> an appurtenant easement. They're, they're, even if you make the argument, well, they've got an easement, but they haven't used it for the last 50 years, that does not mean it goes away. You can make that argument, but who do you need to agree with you and say, yep, you're right, there's no more easement? Court of law. You need a court. You need a judge to agree. Okay. So the only way to terminate and a pertinent easement is probably going to be through a court judgment. I want to show you practically, this slide has nothing to do with like the testing, but I want to show you practically why this is such an important thing when you're selling a property. And I like to, I like to show you things that are near and dear to my own heart. This is actually my street. Um, it, you, you cannot, well, you can see my lot on here. My lot is this one right here. This is my lot up here. So that I'm not talking about my lot right now. But what I want to show you is this is what we call a plat map. If you notice right here, it says the final plat map for McDonald Wood subdivision. Um, and if you actually look right here, it's a little bit hard to read. But this map was recorded in July of 1979. Does everybody see that, that I just circled right there? That this map has been around at the Wake County Courthouse since 1979? That's a long time since that map was recorded. Down the street, so here's U.S. Highway 1 and 64 right here, and that currently exists. And there is a park that runs through this area right in here. There's McDonald Woods Park and the Cary Greenway right there. Down at the end of the street right now at the corner right here, so I'm focused on this area right here, there are two of my neighbors who are up in arms. And they're up in arms because the town of Cary has the nerve to come in and put a pedestrian bridge on their property, which connects my, our street to the Cary Greenway system. Now, right now that's wooded land behind them. And what Cary is gonna do is come through and put paved concrete pedestrian bridges there that connect to the Greenway. And those pedestrian bridges are gonna run down directly beside, in one case, it's 10 feet from the side of the house. So they're gonna have a pedestrian bridge 10 feet from the end of their house. Mm -hmm. And they are up in arms that the town has done them wrong. Folks, the town ain't done nothing that they didn't tell you they were gonna do all the way back in 1979. And if you didn't pay attention, that's your own damn fault when you know you've owned those properties all those years ago. I want you to look right here and Seth's pointing them out. What existed on this map all the way back in 1979? Have those, have those easements been there the entire time, folks? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They sure have. And so those people that bought those houses that Crazy. didn't have those pedestrian bridges and those pedestrian accesses there. Yeah, 
it's nice that it didn't have it, but should they have recognized that that could happen at any time because the town had that easement? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And it's going to go right in their yard. It's going right. I mean, literally, you can, I mean, you can see, here's the easement right here. There's the easement right there. Oh, my gosh. And right there. I mean, that sucks. I mean, it is going to be beside those houses. So they're losing land, actually. Well, they're not losing land. They'll still own it, but they just got to share it with the whole town of Cary. Ah, uh, makes the town sense. Cary has an easement over it. So if there's own, any, they'll own a really fancy, nice pedestrian bridge, but they just got to let everybody else use it. So what about and there's going to have implications for traffic and everything else, right? Yeah, right, for sure. What about if there's damage to those bridges? Well, then that would be the, the town of Cary will most likely maintain them. I'm sure that would be okay. part of the. I'm sure the if agreement. you pull up the easement, I'm sure that's part of the written agreement there. That okay. any construction, any work would be the town of Cary. But, but wow. it's interesting to see though. This was planned and potential way back in 1979 when this plat map was drawn, and here we are in 2021, and they're just now exercising that right. Mm -hmm. so, so just because you've not used an easement does not mean it goes away. Is everybody okay with that? Yes. It's very cool to see how far in advance they like plan out these things. It's yeah. really cool. It's like seeing the future, right? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So as, so, as so a property a new... owner, Travis, um, can you... Like you own that land, but can is there anything you can do so that it's not developed like at the beginning of purchase? If you see that, if you see this plat map. You cannot you purchase it if you see that easement there. That's your choice. choice right? okay. That's okay. the choice you make is don't buy it. Okay, because right. it's never going to change. There's, there's never going to change. It's, with it. the, okay. That's exactly right. You sit there, you have to sit there and say, okay. I'm buying this understanding this potential exists. And so you have to accept that this potential exists. And, you know, like that, that, that's like I, I, uh, I had this discussion with, so my family owned a, a sports bar one time. And when it was built, it was out in the middle of the country. And they built this little subdivision right behind it. And people bought the two houses right behind the bar. Now, let me ask y'all a question. If you buy a house that's behind a bar in the middle oh. of the country, that's been there for been there. 20 some years. You don't have much right to get mad when it's loud at two o'clock in the morning and the place is dumping out, right? Mm -hmm. Because you bought your property knowing that that nuisance already existed there. And, you know, and they used to come over and complain. I mean, like, I, I didn't buy a bar near your house. You bought a house near a bar. That's, I, I, can't, I don't know how to explain that to you, right? It, it's on you, you know? And that's the same thing with these easements. Those property owners, while I understand and I am sympathetic to them, I was trying to explain this to the neighbor down the street. He, he said, well, I didn't own this in 1979. I said, I know that. But when you bought it, and he bought it in like his house in like 2005, I said, when you bought this house in 2005, the easement was there. It's still there right now. It was there then. So you essentially agreed to accept this reality way back then. Whether you want to admit that or not, you did. Okay. So let me ask a quick one before you move from this nice illustration. So th these are examples of easements in gross. These are examples of easements in right. gross because uh, they benefit the town of Cary. That's exactly right. Not neighboring. Thank you, Cary. Howard. Right, 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 right. But uh, the houses to the far left, I do not see the appurtenant easements illustrated here. Um, there are no appurtenant easements on this map that I can see. Okay. But but if they were, would they be on this map? Yes, if there were oh, okay, pertinent they easements, okay. they would be on this map, right. All, right? all right, cool, thanks. But there are there are none on this map that I can see. A pertinent easements would be like a shared driveway. So like, uh, imagine if you know like lot 161 and 162 here. Let's say there was only one driveway for the two houses. You you might see something that looked like that. Okay, so the so and they would they would write easement in have a little yes okay that's exactly All right, right. Okay. not only would they write okay. easement but they would write who it belongs to so that you know if it was if the easement was here on lot number 162 they would write easement and then they would have an arrow that points back to lot 161 so uh, if, okay. if that was the appurtenant easement right there and it pointed from if the easement was on lot 162 
and it pointed back to 161. Lot 162, is that the dominant property or the servient property? Which one is 162? 162. Servient? Servient. Servient, and 161 would be the what? Dominant. Would be the dominant. If I there, use if, you. If that a pertinent easement was there. So I know there's a couple of questions here in the chat, which I really kind of just want to clarify for everybody. Like, if you are a real estate agent, and you are representing somebody, obviously it's in the best interest and most typically the buyer's responsibility to figure this information out. But what are they hiring us for? They don't know this stuff. That's exactly so typically right. every time you ask that question, yes, we have a responsibility to guide our, the people we represent in this. That's exactly right. They hired us to be their expert. Now, does that mean that we have to, pers and this is where you have to separate this, us being responsible for something and us having to personally do it are two entirely different things. So this is where you need to make sure that your buyer is utilizing, either you're doing this research for them or that they're utilizing somebody else like a surveyor who's gonna go pull, because one of the things you would hire a surveyor for would be to come out, map out the property and map any easements on the property so that the buyer is fully aware of those. So it's Absolutely. all about making sure that your clients are aware of these things because that's Informed. where that protective mechanism of, a, we're supposed to be like their parents, right? We're supposed mm -hmm. to shield them from harm because we are the expert. And we can do everything for them or we need to say, hey, you need to get somebody else. And here's the thing, like Seth said it exactly right. Of course, we're responsible. It's not like I had to go like show my super secret password decoder ring to find this. It took me three minutes to find this map in the Wake County courthouse. So if I can find it as a real estate broker, then you can too. Uh, yeah. And so that's why the law would say, yes, you're responsible for something like that. So, okay. and, and so and, Elizabeth asked a good question. Go ahead. Yeah, Elizabeth did ask a good question. Could a buyer who had a buyer's agent, as an example, sue that potentially sue their buyer's agent who didn't disclose these kinds of things? I would say absolutely. I mean, the, the argument you would make is, well, if I had wanted to be on my own, I'd have been on my own, but I hired an agent because I needed help with things like these, you know? Mm -hmm. so I, how, how was I supposed to know what easement was going to come across my yard? I, this is not my profession. So right. well, it is, but that's I'm right. Not. That's the argument you would make. Absolutely. I have, this, I have a quick question. Sure. So say for instance, so this plot map was pre, um, was finalized in 79. And so all the easements are now put in, for example. When can the city change or create a new plat and say we want to use this greenway for something else totally? So we have to create a new plat. So even though even though this is the final plat, when can well, first of all, you're misunderstanding a plat map. The city didn't create the plat map. The developer created the plat map. At some point, one developer owned all of this. And they, sub they subdivided the land, and it was that developer who created this plat map. And it's most likely that developer who also gave the town of Cary those easements there, probably in exchange for the town of Cary doing things like running water and sewer to the properties because that's what happens with developers they need something from somebody so they trade off something they're like okay town of Cary we need water and sewer because we can sell these properties for more if they have access to water and sewer and the town of Cary is like okay well then fine give us these easements in case we ever want them to connect to our greenway system so the developer made that deal in 1979 but this mm -hmm. is the this plat map came from the developer not from the town Gotcha. So if another developer came in and wanted to do something, they wanted to change the whole greenway and make some restaurants and whatnot, then they will create a new plat map for the purchase. Well, not, but just, not here. This, this plat map is for the McDonald Woods subdivision. The, the plat map that you're looking at doesn't include the greenway. That's all, over, all of this stuff over. Let me see if I can highlight all this over here. All of this over here is just for reference purposes. It, what you're looking at, the map you're looking at is the stuff on the left. That's the subdivision. That's the plat map of the subdivision. That's never going to change because you can't, one developer can't come in and change lots that they don't own. The only way that plat map's ever changing is if somebody buys all those lots and then redraws the property lines. Travis, do we as agents get 
in California, we got a preliminary title report, which had a flat map on it and showed everything that was recorded against the property at that moment in time. Do we get anything like that as agents in North Carolina? You have to do all the legwork yourself. What are we paying the attorney for? Well, that's 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 a good question. And so I always <laughs> hold them to a little bit higher standard. Yeah. All right. Got you. And so all that yellow is the town of Cary? Yeah, all that yellow over there is land owned by the town of Cary. That's exactly right. Okay. Travis, I had a question also. Yes, Aloysia. Okay. Um, I know a few years ago where I stayed, it was people who owned properties um, and they needed to run a highway through it. So I, did, I don't, with that, with, does that mean that everybody who had the deed to their house had already had the, um, had it set with their deed, let them know that? No, it's, that's a different process, which we're going to talk about later on called eminent okay. domain, which is a government entity coming in and taking ownership of the property after the fact. So okay. let's be clear. If the town of Cary came through and decided that Coresdale Drive needed to be double wide. If, if, so here's Coresdale Drive right here right now as it exists, right? If the town of Cary, which it belongs to the town of Cary, that's their property. If the town of Cary decides that Coresdale, wide needs to be, Coresdale Drive needs to be double wide, well, the only option is to take property from either side, right? To widen that street. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that property they're taking is private property. And so they have to, that, there's a process called eminent domain to take that property. That's not an easement. That's an actual taking of the property. Okay. I just wonder if that meant every single person that stayed there already had an easement in their deed, but I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. Yep. Um, and that's exactly right, Rachel. Th that, this is not an example of eminent domain. This was an easement that was freely given by somebody. Yeah, this was not one taken by the town of Cary. The developer drew this on there. They created Quick it. Quick reminder, just to bring it back into perspective, the easement grants use of use. the property without ownership. Of the correct. Property. That's correct. Exactly right. So these the red squiggles over oh, here, here, the town of Cary does not own those red, red squiggles. They have an easement over that property. That's the difference. How many of you feel like you got something from looking at that map and, and understanding like the importance of easements and how they can be important even years and years and years down the road? Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Like right. Elizabeth yeah. said, you could be sued. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. Okay. All right. Let's take a, a break. Um, Yay! That's a good spot for a break. So let me pause the video here. If I can get over there to that. So. Before we broke, we talked about easements, which are an example of encumbrances. Now we want to mention some other encumbrances and kind of build up to the other big encumbrance topics, which, which is liens. But before that, these are just some just, ones that you might encounter as far as like vocabulary words on the test go, um, much less important than easements. The big ticket items for encumbrances are easements and liens. And we kind of bookend the chapter with those. We start with, income, with uh, easements and we end with liens. But there are other types of encumbrances. And an encumbrance, like I said, is just any sort of limitation that has been placed on the property. And uh, there is one called a Lee pending. It looks like list pending, but it's pronounced Lee pending, not that you really care. And that that is basically just like a court order that says don't sell this property because there's some kind of lawsuit pending with relation to the property. It's like a warning to a buyer. You would not want to buy this because somebody is being sued about this property. This property is the subject of a lawsuit. And so that's, uh, that's one that we want to, um, you know, just kind of be familiar with as far as the terminology goes. Encroachments, though, are ones that I do think you will probably see pop up on the test. Not necessarily a question about encro encroachments, but certainly that vocabulary will pop up. An encroachment, and I'm going to show you a picture of one here in just a second. An encroachment is um, any crossing of the property line um, when we're talking about like a structure, uh, a fence that crosses a property line, a driveway that crosses a property line, any improvement illegally 
crosses a property line is called an encroachment. And we'll, I'll give you a visual example of those coming up here a little bit later. And then um, a writ of attachment is very similar to a lee pendens. These two are almost identically the same with each other. Um, the writ of attachment and the lee pendens are pretty much the same thing. They are, again, just a court order that says, don't, don't sell this property right now. Don't buy this property right now because there is this litigation pending. There is this lawsuit that could impact the property. One of the most common examples of encumbrances that we deal with are restrictive covenants. Now, they can be um, talking about um, uh, CCRs, deed restrictions, restrictive covenants, just covenants. They all mean the same thing on the test. No matter how they state that, you know, whether they're talking about uh, uh, covenant, and a lot of people think of this as the HOA. The HOA is not the covenants, though. The HOA is like the, the enforcement of. The HOA is the police. The covenants are the laws. Hopefully that analogy helps, right? You can't violate the HOA. You don't violate the police. You violate the law, and the police come after you for violating the law. Does that make Do you sense? you mind repeating that? The first part of that. You don't violate, you don't violate the HOA. The HOA is not the rules. The HOA is the enforcement of the rules in some cases, right? So you would not, you like you wouldn't say I violated the police. You say you violated okay. the law. The the HOA is the police, the covenants are the laws, the rules, okay. right? And so it's the rules that run with the land it, and, and they, they can be called either covenants or CCRs or deed restrictions. They all mean the same thing. They got to be recorded because again, they are pertinent to the property. They last forever. And it's basically a current owner restricting future. Owners. That's what's happening when you get these covenants placed on the property, you take a current owner and you're going to restrict them um, and they're also restricting all those future owners, what they can do with them. On the test, there are going to be questions that come up about like enforcement of covenants. Be very careful of those questions. Look at this statement right here. It says enforcement of covenants is up to who? What's the answer you're looking for on the test, folks? Neighbor, the neighbors. The neighbors, right? Yeah. They're, 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 the enforcement belongs to the neighbors. And it, notice it says, act, the, and the neighbors can act how if they want to. How can they, uh, how many neighbors does it take to enforce the covenants against another neighbor? One. one. Just one. People don't like to answer that on the test, but it's true. That one neighbor subject, because remember, if they're your neighbor and they're in the same subdivision, they're subject to the same rules you are, the same restrictions. And so you hold each other responsible for those rules. It's like self-policing. Don't The answer is not going to be call the police. Don't choose that answer. It's wrong. The answer is not going to be go complain at City Hall or file a complaint with the zoning department. That's all wrong because that's the government and the government had nothing to do with these restrictions. What's the, who is the only person who can enforce these covenants against one neighbor? Other neighbors. Other neighbors. Yeah. Other neighbors. Neighbor. The other neighbors. Now they could act by themselves or they can act as a big group of people called an HOA, but it's still your neighbors doing the enforcement. One of the other big statements that I think will show up on a test that you'll have to deal with is this one right here. They're going to ask you on the test like, well, what if the city's zoning rules say um, you can have fences up to six feet high, but the covenants say you can have fences only four feet high? Which one do you follow, the city's rules or the covenants? Can I say that again? Covenant. The city, covenant. And, and the answer in that case is the covenants. But if I flipped it, what would the answer be? If I said the covenant says this is up to six feet high, but the city zoning says four, no more than four feet, which one would you follow? City. Four feet. The, the city. city. The city. The so the answer is you follow the more strict of the two. Whenever there's a conflict between two sets of rules, 
you're not allowed to violate either one of them. Neither one is more important than the other. They're both rules. So uh, here's the, the way I like to think of this. My parents were notorious for giving me two different times to be home. And I always wanted to ask my dad because my dad didn't really care if you ever came home, mm -hmm. you know? And so I'd ask, I'd ask dad, what time do I need to be home? Well, I don't know. Anytime before midnight. It's all right. Okay, good. And then right as I was walking out the door, my mom would yell at me, you better be home before 10 o'clock. Now I've got two sets of rules. Which one do I have to follow? Well, there's your one. mom. The mom your because mom. in your that mom. case, that one was the one that was more what? It's strict. 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 Right? If I came home before 10 o'clock, obviously I was still going to be fine with dad's rule because that was before 12 o'clock. So it's not that you just pick and choose. It is that you, you figure out which one is more strict and that's the one you apply. Is everybody okay with that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. When you have um, those kinds of conflicts. Something that I really want to just kind of make sure everybody's aware of are that these are private. So it's not like your police, which I think you mentioned, are going to come and enforce these rules. It's the neighbors. That's exactly right. Private controls, covenants are private controls. One thing that they will absolutely test you on because it's really important in the real world. Remember that covenants can be attached by anybody who owns real estate. We have to be real honest with ourselves, folks, and admit that we're going to come across pieces of property that at some point in their existence have been owned by some pretty gross people. Can, can we agree that if you're buying property in the South, in North Carolina, that you're probably going to find some property that at some point was owned by somebody who had some, some really... Uh, grotesque views about things like race, for example. If you, I mean, if you go back far enough in time and you think about a property in North Carolina, now we're not talking about the current owner, but we're talking about a previous owner. Is it possible that somebody who owned a, 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 a subdivision home in Raleigh in 1945 might have had some pretty gross views about race? Is that possible? Mm -hmm. And folks, as the owner of a property, are you allowed to place any restrictions you want on that property as long as those restrictions don't violate the law at that point in time? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> what that means is that there would be some restrictions placed. How many of you think there were developers in Raleigh who would have placed right in the covenants that the properties cannot be sold to people of certain races? What do y'all think? Yes. For yeah. sure, hundred percent guaranteed. Here's the unfortunate reality, folks. How long do covenants and appurtenances last? Forever, forever. Are those covenants still going to be attached to that property? Yes, they are. They are. But here is very important for real world reference mm -hmm. and for test taking purposes. If you come across such a covenant that would be illegal in today's environment, then it is unenforceable in today's environment. It's still there. You will still see it, but do not try to enforce it. Unfortunately, there are still examples of people who try to enforce these things now, and they'll say, well, that's not my opinion. It's just what the rules say. It doesn't work that way. In fact, there was a case of this not too long ago. I brought it up in class a, a couple months ago, and I, I read it, and I, I read it, and I reread it, and I couldn't believe it. First of all, this is a weird area of real estate anyway to get into, but it is real estate. Selling burial plots, that's a real estate transaction because you're actually selling the land. If you're selling somebody a cemetery plot, it's, it's a real estate transaction. Mm -hmm. So you have to be licensed as a real estate broker in a lot of cases to sell burial plots. There was a case not long ago in Louisiana where the lady who was selling burial plots in a cemetery refused to sell a burial plot to a Black family because the cemetery's covenants said that only white people could be buried there. And she attempted to use as justification for her actions that she was simply following the covenants. I am not pointing that out to talk about what a gross piece of crap she is because that is clearly evident mm -hmm. in my opinion it's only my opinion 
I'm bringing that up to point out you don't enforce things that if they were written today would be what? Illegal. 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 So even though they may still exist, they are not enforceable. Is everybody good with that as far as the an answer goes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, personally, I wish there was a much more straightforward way to clean them up and eliminate them. Uh, that, that would be my preference to get rid of them. Um, and there is movement among the state legislature to create that process, in essence, to essentially say it, when we come across covenants that are illegal now, they would be stricken from the property just because it's kind of traumatic to, in, I mean, it's, isn't it kind of crappy if you're looking at buying a house and you and you come across such a restriction, even if you know it's not enforceable, just the fact that it's there? I mean, it's just gross. It's so, uh, but that is the answer. Um, and Tyler, you don't even have to do that. You don't have to take them to court. You just don't follow them as far as getting it getting removed, it. though. Unfortunately, yeah, they can't right through, now. It's a very lengthy court process to get them removed, and that's what they're trying to clean up. As far as how we respond to them, we just don't enforce them. We ignore them. We pretend they're not there. Yeah. Um, um, and now we come to the other sort of big topic when it comes to um, encumbrances <laughs> on property. The, the first big one that we started with that almost every property has to deal with is easements. This one is the other big limitation that almost every property in fact i can back up and say not almost every property every property is going to have to deal with liens at some point or another so yeah. we need to talk about what a lien is and why that's important in real estate terminology and so this is finally the first time where we kind of bring up the subject of money as it relates to real estate. It takes us a while to get to the subject of money, but then when we get there, I think most people are like, okay, we can stop talking about money now because this is driving me nuts. It's too much math because that's where all the math comes in when we start bringing the money into the picture. Um, but liens are an example of a tremendously common sort of limitation on property because liens represent debt. A lien is a debt. And when you have a debt, you have a debtor and you have a lien holder, somebody who is owed the money and somebody who is in debt, who owes the money. Um, and so the lien holder is the one who is owed the money while the debtor is the person who owes the money. When it comes to liens, this is going to show up on the test, by the way. 100% guarantee it's going to be a test question about the difference between specific liens and general liens. I, I, I cannot imagine you would escape a license exam without a question about the difference between specific liens and general liens. Here is the difference. Debt needs something to attach to. In your mind right now, you probably have a little bit of the wrong sort of definition of how debt works. We tend to associate debt as being always a personal thing. It's money owed by a person. That is not true. Money is almost always borrowed by a person but it's not necessarily owed by a person. Sometimes debts are owed by people. That's called a general lien, right? A general, oops, oops, you do that. I know, that's been happening to me the past couple of days. A general lien is a debt owed by a person. So when it, the way we would accurately say a general lien, Seth owes $27,000. More than that, actually. That's a general lien because the money is owed specifically by who? Seth. By Seth. Seth. <laughs> the other type of lien, which is the one that we're going to actually spend much more time on in this class, is something called a specific lien. A specific lien is a lien that is not owed by a person, but is owed by a specific piece of real estate. 
the real, even if the person borrowed the money, it's ultimately not the person that we're going to look to to pay. It's the property that we're going to look to to pay. Now, people have, uh, say that say to me all the time, I don't know what that means. How does a property pay? How could a property pay? There's one way a property can pay money through a process called what? Foreclosure. 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 And that's exactly what specific liens do. Specific liens create the ability for the property to be foreclosed on. Whenever you see a specific lien, the word that should immediately pop to mind is foreclosure. A specific lien is a debt that has been attached to the real estate in a way that allows the real estate to be foreclosed in order to pay the debt. I'm going to say that again. A specific lien is a debt that has been attached to the real estate in a way that allows the real estate to be foreclosed in order to satisfy the debt. So based on that, would you say a mortgage loan is a general lien owed by Seth or a specific lien owed by Seth's house? Which one would you say a mortgage loan is? Owned by Seth's house. Specific. So specific. Oh, general. Uh, that would be a general. General. A mortgage loan. A general specific. lien. And this is why you get, I, I say you. I don't know why the drum rolls. A general lien is owed by a person. person. A specific lien is owed by a what? Property. Property. A property. If the lien involves real estate, which one is it, folks? Specific. 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 Stop being hard-headed. So I think mortgage, I must have heard wrong. A mortgage loan, what kind of lien do we have? Specific. A specific <laughs> lien. Because if it doesn't get paid, what can it result in? Closure. That's how you know it's a specific lien. Any debt that if unpaid can result in foreclosure is what kind of a lien? A specific. A specific lien. And here's the interesting thing, folks. They're not going to go after Seth for that money. They're going to go after his what? His house. His property. His property for that money. Because that's what the lien was attached to. It was attached to the property. Now, if Seth owes the IRS $50,000, do you think that's a specific lien or do you think that's a general lien? General lien. General. general. A general, general lien. Because that lien yeah. is attached to Seth the person. Now, here's what I want to point out to you. People in their brain get this all screwed up too. Which one do you think is worse to have? A general lien that follows you as a person or a specific lien that is limited to that one piece of real estate? Which one is worse to have? General. 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 general lien is far worse to have. Because here's the thing. If Seth owns 26 pieces of real estate, how many pieces of real estate could he lose if he has a general lien against him? Every one of them. Every single one of them. And not only that, could his wages be garnished? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Could he go to prison for not paying? Yeah. Yes. Yes, because he personally owes that money. Does that make sense for everybody? Yes. 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 But with a specific lien, what's the worst and only bad outcome that can happen as a result of that specific lien? It's a foreclosure on that property. Foreclosure yeah, on just that what? Yeah, one property. One property. If he owns 26 <laughs> houses and he doesn't pay the mortgage on one of them, can they foreclose on all 26 or just that one that that yeah. lien attached to? Just, just that, that one. one. Just that one. That's why we call them specific liens. Specific liens only impact that one piece of property. Does that make sense for everybody? Mm -hmm. Just that one piece of property. Thankfully, from our perspective, 
almost all the liens that we deal with in a real estate class are specific liens and not general liens. We actually have a very different terminology that we usually refer to general liens as that you're probably more familiar with. You just haven't yet made the connection. Some of you may be familiar with this terminology. Have you ever heard of somebody who has a judgment against them? Yes. When someone has a judgment against them, guess what kind of lien that is? General. general. That is a general lien, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Specific liens only attached to that one piece of property. You're going to get a test question about that, about differentiating a specific lien from a general lien for sure. Absolutely. Now, when it comes to the specific ones, because those are the ones that we want to break down much more uh, in detail. Some of them are voluntary and some of them are not voluntary. So, like, for example, if 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 someone goes out and takes out a mortgage note, do you think that's a voluntary specific lien or an involuntary one? Are they being forced to take out that mortgage note or are they taking that out because they want to? Voluntary. Well, voluntary. Voluntary. That's voluntary. Mm -hmm. But then we're going to talk about ones like property tax liens. Do you think you have a choice as to whether or not you get a lien against your property for property taxes? No. Please. No. no. So that would be an example of an involuntary Lien. So these liens, these specific liens can come into existence in a, in, in a couple of different ways, either voluntarily or involuntarily. Here's another set idea, super big idea, simple, simple slide, but such a big idea. Specific liens are appurtenant. Now we've talked about that word appurtenant. And this is where the rubber really meets the road as to whether or not you've actually made peace with what the word appurtenant means. What does the word appurtenant mean, folks? Attaches to the land, attaches to the land forever. Attaches to the land forever, right? Attaches to the land forever. Hypothetical situation. Y'all ready? You ready? You ready? Mm-hmm. Yasser purchases a property and borrows $250,000 on a mortgage note, which is a, becomes a specific lien against the property. Everybody with me so far? Mm -hmm. so Yasser owns the property. He's got a $250,000 specific lien to Bank of America on the property. Yasser sells the property to Taj for $300,000 without paying off the specific lien to Bank of America. Can Bank of America foreclose on Taj's new house? Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. No. What do y'all think? Oh, you go, girl. Well, if he sells it, it goes to the person who owns it now. What do y'all think? Can Bank of America foreclose on Taj's new house? Its specific yeah. lien is a pertinent. Yes, they the runs with the land. Runs yeah. with the land. Yeah. Who owns the yeah. land, folks? Yes, yeah, sir, doesn't anymore. That's right. Who owns the land? Taj. Taj does. So can Taj, who had nothing to do with this debt, who didn't even know it existed, end up with her property foreclosed as a result of a loan that Yasser took out. Yes. 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 And by okay. the way, Yasser is laughing his ass off <laughs> on a beach somewhere at Taj right now. Because guess what? They can't come after Yasser. Yasser is not responsible for the debt. <laughs> The property was responsible for the debt. And so if the debt is not paid, they're coming after the what? The property. The property, and it doesn't matter who happens to own the property at that point in time. Absolutely. And Taj said, no, he will not be laying on a beach laughing somewhere because she's going to take care of that. She's going to take matters into her own hands. Uh so some are asked, how do you prevent that? That's a good question. How do Attorneys? you prevent that? Well, yeah. these specific liens, I'm going to back up. 
how do you think a specific lien gets attached to a property? The development recorded, recorded. Would it be like it, really it nice if there was like some central location yeah, where you could like, keep all the real estate property records and everything that might impact a piece of property in one place? It would sure be nice if we had a place like that, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Facebook, the of record, Facebook. Mm -hmm. Where do you think these specific liens are going to be recorded, folks? In the court. courthouse. At the courthouse in the county where the property is located. So what should Taj have done before she paid Yasser for that property? A title she search. She should have done a title search. And she should have seen and searched for any liens that have been attached to that property. Does that make sense for everybody? Mm -hmm. And yeah. if she had been real smart, what she would have probably said to Yasser is, now one of two things is going to happen, Yasser. Either you're going to pay that lien off before I give you any money, which is probably not going to happen because can we agree that Yasser probably doesn't have the $250,000 to pay the lien off before he sells the house to Taj, right? Right. right. Or if Taj, if Taj was real smart, what she would say is, okay, Yasser, I can do math real good. If you're selling me the property for $300,000, and you've got this debt of 250 outstanding on the property. I'm only giving you how much money, Yasser? 50,000. $50,000 because the other 250 $50, I'm sending to Bank of America to pay this debt off so that my property doesn't have a lien on it. How many of you all think that's an important part of the purchase process right there? Finding those liens and Perfect. making sure they get satisfied before closing. Extremely important. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because these liens, can, they haunt the property, folks. They come for the property. No matter who owns it, these liens come in the middle of the night and take the property. So, so that would be how you would prevent it. That's how you prevent it. You do a good title search. That's exactly right. And, and by the way, people are human. People make mistakes. Could things get missed in title searches every once in a while? Yeah. What do y'all think? I would think so, yeah. 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 Unfortunately, as much it happens as happens all the time. As much as we'd yeah. love to say no, it does happen all the time because these are humans doing the search. Gosh, it would be nice, like, you know, you know how like you know how like you can go out and pay a company in case you get sick, they'll help you with the expense of that. And like you can pay a company, like if you wreck your car they'll help you with the expense of that or you can pay a company if you die they'll help you with the expense of that what, what do we what do we call those companies where you can pay them sure that they help insurance. you in case things go wrong yes highway robbery you need title insurance we call them insurance company do you think there's a such thing folks as insurance. title insurance mm -hmm. so yeah. You get title insurance in case the humans who are doing your title search make a mistake. Does that, how's that, how reasonable does that sound now? Right. So now when somebody asks, when you're buying a property and somebody says, do you want title insurance? What's your answer going to be? Yes. yes. Oh yeah. Cause I don't trust whoever's doing this title search enough to be sure they made zero mistakes. So yes, I want title insurance. I want some mm -hmm. insurance company to help me pay for this mess if we end up with a title. So let me point that out. Would Taj be breathing a lot easier if she had done a title search, she missed the lien, and she bought title insurance? Would she be feeling a lot better right now if she had done that? Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. It's yes, a because... small cost and all serious compared to the um, advantages. So who would she be in contact with right now? If she realized that she paid him $300,000 and she missed the lien and it didn't get satisfied, who would she be in contact with right now? Her insurance her company. Title insurance. Her title insurance company. She'd be filing a claim against her title insurance company and they would hopefully help her satisfy this problem and get this thing fixed. That's why you have title insurance. See how you start to put the ideas together of why these things all make sense with each other? Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. Okay. Now, absolutely. When we talk about specific liens, remember that some of them are voluntary and some of them are involuntary. The voluntary ones become a lien when we go to the courthouse and we record or file that lien against the property. When that happens, 
what's actually occurring is that the the person borrowing the money is agreeing that this lien can be placed against their property. We actually sign a document called a deed of trust yeah. that says, I agree that my property can be used as collateral. That, that's a word that we're going to talk about quite a bit when we get to financing later on in the class, the word collateral. When you are allowing a lien to be attached to your property, what you're saying is, I'm okay with this idea that my property could be used as collateral, which means ultimately I'm okay with you doing what with my property if I don't pay you back. Taking it. Or it's closing it. it. Or closing it. Now let's talk it's about not what, taking. Let's talk about what foreclosure is, because that's a common misconception about foreclosure as well. Foreclosure is not actually taking of the property. Foreclosure literally translates to forced closing. A foreclosure is a sale. It's a forced sale. When somebody is foreclosing on a property, they're not actually taking the property from you. They're forcing you against your will to do what with the property? To sell it. To sell it. Sell it. Exactly right. A foreclosure is a forced sale. And I've had people say, that's not true. I'm like, how is that not true? They're like, they never gave me the opportunity to sell my house. They just put a notice on the door so they were going to foreclose. I said, and when they put the notice on the door, when they put the notice on the door, how long did you have before they sold the house? She said, it was like 45 days. I said, and you don't think that was your notice to sell the damn thing before they did? Yeah. What do you think they were giving you notice to do? They're saying to you, you got 45 days to do one of two things. Sell it yourself and pay us off, or we will do what for you? <laughs> sell it for you. <laughs> we will sell it for you. That's what a foreclosure notice is, folks. It's notice that, hey, we've reached the end of the road here. Either you sell it and give us our money, or we will sell it for you and get our money. That's what a foreclosure is. Okay? So it's not actually taking the property, it's forcing it to be sold. One of the liens that you might be asked about, specific liens, we're talking about just specific ones, so the ones that attach to real estate. One of the liens that you might be asked about on the test is something called a mechanics lien, which means the same thing as a workman's lien, which means the same thing as a material man's lien. I've tried to include all the different ways that could be referred to on the test so you don't think it's different things. A material lien, a workman lien, a mechanic lien, they all mean the same thing. Mechanics lien is the way we refer to them in North Carolina, but on the national section of the test, they could refer to it as a material man's lien or a workman's lien. But ultimately it all amounts to the same thing. This is a lien where either labor, or materials, or often both, have been provided without payment to the property. So some vendor has supplied lumber. Some vendor has supplied labor. They've come in and they've done work. And so they have provided a service or materials to that property and have not been paid for their service or materials. I think my connection's okay, Chassie. Chassie asked a question. Is, is everybody else hearing me okay? I'm getting okay. Um, yes. Let's see. I'm good. Okay. Um, yeah, I hear you. The vendor has not been paid for their services. Folks, that vendor has a right to file a lien against this property. Here's where your, your mind is going to, what you think you know, your gut instinct is going to get in your way of answering the question correctly. I'm just going to give you definitionally things and then I'm going to ask you a question. Okay. A mechanics lien is a specific lien against a property. A specific lien represents the right to foreclose on a property. 
A mechanics lien can be placed by any vendor who provides either work or materials to a property. Everybody, those are the definitional statements. Everybody good with that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Rachel has a landscaper come in and plant three rose bushes at her house and she does not pay the landscaper. Can the landscaper foreclose on her home for payment of the three rose bushes? Yes. 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 Don't let your stubbornness get in the way. Now, is it likely to play out that way? No. I can't imagine a landscaper that would go through the process and the expense of filing this lien paying an attorney to handle a foreclosure, dealing with that whole process. But from a strictly, you know, just is it possible perspective, can that landscaper foreclose on Rachel's house if she doesn't pay for the rose bushes? Yes. 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 That's what a mechanics lien is. Now, obviously, these are much more likely to be with big projects, things that are big money. Think, if you owe a handyman $200, they can file one of these liens and they can foreclose. But considering they're going to have to spend a couple thousand dollars to file the lien and pay the attorneys to handle all of that, they're probably not going to. But if you owe an HVAC company $10,000, are they probably a little bit more interested in pursuing this if you don't pay them? Yes. Yeah. So this gets to be with bigger ticket items. How many of you have had somebody come to your door and the first question they ask you is, are you the owner of the house? Mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. One of the reasons they're asking that question is they only have the right to file a lien against the property if the work was ordered by who? Property owner. By the property owner. They have to establish that the work was permitted by the property owner. Now, in North Carolina, and that's why you've got the North Carolina flag here. In North Carolina, these are our rules for mechanics liens. The lien itself has to be filed in what we call a timely manner. Basically, we do not give contractors an unlimited amount of time to file a lien. Here's what we don't want to have happen. We don't want to have some plumber who's driving through a neighborhood and be like, you know what? That house we just passed, I put a toilet in for them three years ago and they never paid me for that thing. I'm going to go file a lien against that property. That would be chaos. Mm -hmm. And so these liens have a time limitation on them. In North Carolina, that time limitation is 120 days. And that clock starts to tick when the contractor walks away from the job. So, 100, so the last minute that the contractor was on the property, the last minute they were doing work, the last time they delivered materials, start a clock. Think of it this way. When your contractor walks off the job, they're punching a time clock. How much time's on the clock? 120 days. 120 days. Within that 120 days, if they want to file a lien against the property, that's when they should do it. Now, hopefully they get what during that 120 days so they don't have to worry about filing a lien. Hopefully what happens? They, they, get, they get paid. paid. They get paid. And most of them are not going to be in any rush to file this lien because filing the lien is not of itself expensive. But if you're at day 110 and you haven't paid them, do they really need to start consider filing that lien? Yes. 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 Because if they wait until six months after the fact, you still owe them the money, but they lose the right to file a lien against the property. Does that make sense for everybody? Yes. Okay. So they can only file this lien within 120 days from when they walk away from the, from the job. If they want to actually foreclose, then they have to do that within 180 days of walking away from the job in North Carolina. So they only have a four month period basically to file the lien and a six month period to foreclose on the property. Um, Elizabeth, it does not result in a lien pendants in North Carolina. If they file the lien, what actually happens is the lien just attaches to the property. And so what would happen is when they, when they sell it, if they, if they choose not to foreclose, um, what would happen is when they, when the property sold down the road, the lien would be satisfied whenever it's sold in the future. And that's so the most likely outcome. So basically both of these timelines, the one to file or record the lien, as well as to take action on the foreclosure, both start on the last day of work. That's right. 
That's okay. exactly right. Thank you. So if you wait <clears throat> until day 120 to file your lien, you only have 60 more days to actually foreclose on the property because the, okay. the clock's running at the same time. It's not 120 I'm plus sorry, 180, right? It's not 120 and then you got another 180 days from filing the lien. It's a total of 180 days to foreclose. Right. That's why most of them don't foreclose. Most of these liens are not going to get foreclosed, but that doesn't mean they're not going to get paid because imagine when the next buyer comes along who wants to buy that property. Even if it's five years down the road, 10 years down the road, 15 years down the road, if you were a buyer and you're looking at buying a property and you do a title search on it and you file and you find this mechanics lien, would you pay the seller for that property or would you say to them, you file, you fit, clear up this lien first and then I'll buy the property from you? Which one would you do? I'd have to clear up the lien. And so that's that's the value in filing these liens. A lot of times they don't get paid till many years after the fact, but that because the lien is a pertinent and stays with the property, they will eventually get taken care of. Everybody all right with that? Yes. What if that business is no longer and like they've, they've gone out of business? Then, you know, then it, it, generally speaking, uh, you would deal with that on a case by case basis whenever you needed to close the property down, you know, down the road, you might have to go to court and get the lien dissolved or something like that. But, uh, you know, that that's sort of a case by case thing. Gotcha. OK. Um, so when we talk about liens. We have to um, image and this is how it looks. I'm sorry, Sean Gill, did you mean that for me or maybe you unmuted by accident? I'm so sorry. I I'm muted by accident. That's all right. That's all right. right. When we talk about these liens, it is very likely that real estate will have multiple liens on it. You need to get that in your brain. Whenever you are buying a property, it's very unlikely that we're going to find a property that doesn't have not doesn't have any liens. It's but it's going to be very likely to find a property that has only one lien. Because almost every property is going to have a property tax lien, which we're going to talk about more in detail after lunch. Uh, you know, almost every property is going to have a mortgage note attached to it. And then some of them have more than one mortgage. And then some of them have also mechanics liens. When there are multiple liens attached to the property, it is very important that we set up an order of payment. I mean, Visualize this, if you will. If you are handing out money and you've got 10 people who all have their hand out for money, money, you want that process to be organized. You want them to stand in a line so that you can pay them one by one. If you're one of the people who is owed money, would you prefer to be at the front of the line or the back of the line? Why does it matter? Why does it matter where you're in line? Because the money will run out. The sales price may not be enough to pay to pay everybody. That's right. The sales price of the property, even in a foreclosure, and sometimes especially in a foreclosure, might not be enough to satisfy all of the liens. And that's where this idea of lien priority. Think about lines. You want to have priority if you're in line, right? When you go get on the airplane, they got the one boarding line and then they got the priority boarding lane. When you go to like Universal Studios in Orlando, they got the regular standby line and then they got the unlimited express pass and you hate those people and give them the stink eyes. They walk <laughs> past you while you're standing there dying in line, right? Uh -huh. That's the priority line, right? And so everybody wants to be priority and everybody hates the people who have priority. That's just the way the world works. Well, the same thing is true with these liens. When a property is sold, these liens get paid based on their priority. So, so does everybody understand what we're talking about before we talk about what the priority order is? Does everybody understand what I mean by saying certain liens are going to get priority over others? Right. Yes. Okay. So now let's look at what the priority is for payment of liens if and when a property is sold. So this is any time a property is sold in North Carolina, and this is the way it's going to be tested nationally as well. 
Anytime the property is sold, this is the order in which the liens are going to be satisfied. This is the order in which the liens are going to be paid off using the money from that sale. And this is true whether it's a foreclosure sale or whether it's a regular sale that doesn't involve foreclosures. This is the order of priority. So look at this. This is really interesting to me. What gets first priority ahead of everything else when a property is sold? The cost, the cost of, of the foreclosure. The cost of the foreclosure, if it's a foreclosure sale. Now, hopefully in most sales, we don't have a foreclosure cost because it's not a foreclosure sale. But if it happened to be a foreclosure sale, any cost associated with the foreclosure, like paying an attorney to deal with it, the court costs associated with it, all of that would come straight off the top and be paid first. Everybody okay with that statement? Yes. Mm -hmm. Then the taxes, any outstanding real estate taxes that are owed on the property and special assessments. And we'll talk about what a special assessment is. A special assessment is just a, a one-time lump sum tax that's usually applied to a property for doing some project on the property. Like if the city, it, uh, if the city comes through and puts sidewalks on your property, they will charge you for the sidewalks. Even if you didn't want the sidewalk, they'll still charge you for it. And they what about that easement example that you were talking? Oh, never mind. That's in the agreement. The that, agreement that, carry. Those are easements. That's not that's not an example necessarily of a special assessment. But like street lighting, anytime that the, the, the municipality has improved your property they can bill you for that. It's just a tax. And so any taxes and any special assessments get paid first in line after the foreclosure costs. I love the example that you give about your street. <laughs> well, yeah, like, so in, on my street, we have sidewalks on one side of the street. And I live on the side of the street that does not have sidewalks, which I think is great because I don't have to deal with having an easement on my property for the sidewalk, number one. Number two, Guess, guess who has to pay for the sidewalks when they're installed? The people's land who the sidewalks are placed on. So those people on the other side of the street, they had to pay for those sidewalks. The city put them in, but those people had to pay for them because it was placed on their property and they paid for them through a special assessment. But I get to use the sidewalks and I didn't have to pay for them. Ain't that nice? Okay. <laughs> Um, and your dogs get to go over there and take really big poops. That's exactly <laughs> right. And I do get to clean the poops up. That's the one thing I do. I, <laughs> and by the way, when you have big dogs, just don't mess around with it. Gallon size Ziploc bags are the way to go. You know, like just, I, I, I don't even know how you people deal with the little plastic things they have at, the, at Petco. I, I, I'm seriously thinking about going to the two gallon size. I just want to be able to get like both <laughs> in, in there at one time, you know, like, cause oh, I, it's just, you know, trust me. It's a lot. Of it. a lot. Travis, how do yes. those um, special assessments, how are those incorporated or, or paid? Is that worked into their property taxes? It will be. It'll, it'll be added to their property tax bill and they usually allow them to pay it over a period of time. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So those get paid second. Then we get to any mortgages um, and yes to the bag inside the bag for sure. Uh, and yes, you will need to know this order. Yes, this order will come up and be tested, right? Um, the mortgages are paid third. And this is also, by the way, where the terminology first mortgage, sec how many of you have ever heard of, oh, I got a first mortgage and a second mortgage? Mm -hmm. Yep. So that's the priority within this group. So what we're saying here is, so let's say, let, uh, let's just make up some numbers here. Let's say we've got, it's a foreclosure sale and there's $10,000 that is the cost of the foreclosure sale. Let's say we've got $8,000 outstanding in property taxes. Let's say we got a first mortgage of $175,000. We've got a second mortgage of... Uh, $125,000. And then down here at the bottom, last in order, we got a mechanics lien of 10 grand for a new HVAC system that was never paid for. Okay. 
So the property is foreclosed on and the property sells for $310,000. Okay, $310,000 sales price at foreclosure. What's going to get paid first? What's going to get satisfied first out of that? What are we what what are we going to deal with first? 10,000 foreclosure. 10, right? Foreclosure. The foreclosure. So that 10,000 goes away first. Right, mm -hmm. which if we do, if we're doing the math over here, minus ten thousand, three hundred thousand. So we're down to three hundred thousand dollars remaining. Right. All right. What goes next? Property, property taxes, taxes. Eight thousand. The property taxes of eight thousand dollars are going to get paid. And by the way, I just want to mention it was the HVAC system. Is the HVAC people that are foreclosing? So oh. they're they're the ones foreclosing because they have the right At to the foreclose. End. Right. But they don't just because they're the ones to foreclose, are they the ones to get paid first, or is this order right. going to be followed? The order. 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 This order is going to be followed. So now we got to pay off the eight thousand dollars. So how much money is left over? Two ninety two. Two ninety two. So now we get to the mortgages. Are we going to pay the one hundred and seventy five thousand dollars first mortgage first, or are we going to pay the one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars second mortgage? One seventy five. One seventy five. You know, and one of these might be a home equity line or something like that. Doesn't matter. What matters is whether it's the first or second one recorded. So we're going to pay the 175, which leaves us with what? What is that? 117. 117. 117. So that one's satisfied. Now, out of this 117, now we need to pay off what? The second mortgage. 125. 125. Oh. Houston, we don't we have, have enough. a problem. It's going to be negative. Oh, yeah. We have a problem. So we're going to give the remaining 117 to the second mortgage holder here. Does that make sense for everybody? Mm -hmm. All yeah. of that is going to them. Now, they're still short by eight grand, mm -hmm. but they're going to get the 117. The HVAC company, who are the ones who foreclosed, how much are they getting out of this foreclosure sale? No. Zero. Zero. Or, at, or as my Spanish speaking friends would say, nada, not a damn thing. Nothing. <laughs> right? Nothing. Zero. Zero. And so that's that's the that's the danger of being at the back of the line. I call this like the the, the world's worst buffet line. Because <laughs> if you're at the back of the line, you're gonna starve. On this mm -hmm. thing. And, and, and they get no use the money with the lawyer and everything. That's it. So it's not worth it. So how do we all feel about this idea of lien priority? Everybody feel pretty good there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then the last thing we want to talk about before we take our lunch break is when we come back from lunch, we're going to focus on the biggest of all liens, which is the, the property tax lien and the math around that. We get to do math after lunch. Aren't you excited? I can feel the excitement boiling out of you. Feel something boiling out of you. I don't know what it is. Um, is an encroachment. I mentioned encroachments earlier. Um, an encroachment is just a limitation on a property because some improvement crosses the property line. Look at this picture. The white lines are the property lines. Do you notice an obvious and glaring problem when you look at where the property lines are in this picture versus where the improvements are? Somebody's pool is yeah. in this <laughs> Somebody done messed up right here. This, this is a problem. Because if you own lot number one right here, the person who owns lot number two back here, can they fill your pool in because it's on their property? Yes. Yeah. Sure they can. It's on their property. This is called an encroachment. And one of the big things to understand about an encroachment is it's not a problem just for lot number one. It's also a problem for lot number two. Does that make sense for everybody? Mm -hmm. It's a problem for both lots. It's a yes. problem for both of them. They probably can't get, actually, they can't get a loan. That, that, that's it. This has got to be remedied. And by the way, 
the easiest way to remedy this would actually be with an easement. If we could get an easement here, that would be a great way to remedy this thing. Because what we would like to get is an easement right here. And by the way, would this be an appurtenant easement or would this be an easement in gross? If we could get an easement right there to allow the pool to stay, stay. would this be an appurtenant easement or an easement in gross? Easement appurtenant. 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 Which one would be the dominant property, one or two? One. One and two would be the servant. Servant. Yeah. And Russell, yes, we could move the property lines and buy that land, but the easement would probably be the easier solution for something like that. And that, folks, is a good place for our lunch break. How about that? <laughs>